All right, everybody, welcome to uh, whoops, our Bag and Sagam joint seminar with Marty Head. Um, so a little of the usual business, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors who are doing wonderful things and give us money to fund us so we can hopefully when we're back in person actually provide you guys with drinks and not just like figure out if we can mail them to your houses. Um, if you would, oh, where's my mouse? If you would like to become a Bagum sponsor, we have various levels um, that you can participate in. We have the silver level at a thousand. That um, let me get this out of the way. You will get you'll get recognition at meetings just like I just did, and our online Bagum. For the silver level, you'll get sorry. For the gold level, you get to chair your own session, and at the platinum level, you get to sponsor a speaker of your choosing. So it doesn't that sound wonderful? The talk that you've always wanted to hear. Um, and just so you guys know who we are, this is the Bagum Executive Committee. That's Brian Kelly, Tony Arvanites, Scott Parker, and myself. Um, if, if you have any interest or recommendations for speakers, please speak to me or Brian. If you want to donate money or if you want to become a sponsor, talk to Tony. And if you want to talk to Scott, talk to Scott because he's awesome. So. With our sister uh, group over in uh, uh, Southern California, we've got the SAGAM Executive Committee of Jamie, Scott, Tony, and David. And I think I saw both Tony and David. Um, you're also welcome to talk to them. We're all very friendly. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing so Marty can give us a wonderful talk. I'm trying to figure out how. Yep, I'm unmuted, so we're good. Great, fantastic. Excellent, and so I'm gonna move some screens around so that I can see what I'm doing here, and then I'll be with you. Okay, so um, Rebecca, I think you, I think I gave you permission to choose my title for me. And so <laughs> <laughs> the Rebecca chosen, Rebecca approved title for my talk is Marty's Adventures in COVID Land. And that is actually what we're going to be talking about. But first I'm gonna give you a quick rundown um, as there's a bunch of folks on the line who I don't think have met me, but you'll have noticed that there are several on the line who do know me. And so I'm gonna do a mix of what the heck are you doing now? And then I'm gonna switch gears into my adventures in COVID land. And so the first thing I'm going to show you, so Shandor, be ready, um, hang on, uh, this is my house. So right now I am sitting on this back porch right here on a hillside in East Tennessee. Looking off in this direction is I can, when the weather is clear, I can see the top of the mountain that was named after my great, 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 great grandfather. And so um, in moving here, I've really, moved back home in a real way because my family, my, my ancestors have been here since the early 1800s, which is not as long as some people who come from the home country, like Christian, who I'm seeing on the screen at the moment from right now, but it is still, or Shondor either really for that matter, but it is still pretty long for in America for someone's family to have been here. And so it's been wonderful to move back. And as a preview of my adventures in COVID land, one of the super exciting things for me is that two weeks before the shutdown, AT&T finally finished the last connection for stringing fiber to my house. So I'm on a gigabit fiber connection while I'm sitting on the back porch talking to you this evening. So it's been, a great place to move to. And the place where I'm working also has lots of hills and lakes and so forth nearby. So I am at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, I am hiding some things so that I can see. Yep, and so this is the view of the Oak Ridge campus. Up until just a few weeks ago, my office was back here in the trees. No, it's not. It's up there in this direction. And right now I have an office in these buildings right here. And so I'm working at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And um, Oak Ridge is one of a whole network 
of national laboratories affiliated with the universe with the US Department of Energy. And so there are 17 national labs. They have different associations. Um, the original three labs were uh, Los Alamos and Hanford, which you don't see here, and Oak Ridge, who were part of the Manhattan Project. Um, but only Los Alamos continues to have a nuclear security component, as do Sandia and Lawrence Livermore. There are some labs who have an energy focus, and so they're sort of excited in some ways by the renewed interest in uh, renewable energies and what we do there. Um, there's one lab that really focuses on environment and the rest of the labs in blue, including Oak Ridge, are affiliated with the part of the Department of Energy that's called the Office of Science. And so we're the, we at Oak Ridge are the largest of the Office of Science labs. And as I mentioned, Oak Ridge National Laboratory evolved from the Manhattan Project. Um, at the time of the Manhattan Project, um, Los Alamos and Oak Ridge, a facility in Chicago and up in Washington State were the original ones working on the Manhattan Project. The role of Oak Ridge National Lab was twofold. Um, the first uh, accountability was physical chemistry and doing the sim, um, separations to separate uranium from plutonium and so forth. And they also, from the very beginning, had a focus on biology and in understanding the impact of radiation on biological systems. In addition, um, the Clinton pile, which you're seeing here, uh, was here at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and it was the world's first continually operated nuclear reactor. And so if and when some of you are able to come visit me here at the lab itself, we'll make sure and arrange for a tour. You can still go into the old facility and hear some of the history of how that all happened and what was going on there. Um, Oak Ridge has an, a large number of user facilities uh, sponsored by the Department of Energy that bring thousands of R&D partners to Tennessee every year. Um, there's the Building Technologies Research and Integration Center, Carbon Fiber, the Nanophase Material Sciences, um, Manufacturing Demonstration Facility is one that I find weirdly fascinating for re reasons we can talk about some other day, um, National Transportation Research Center, um, and the High Flux Isotope Reactor. And so as a consequence of the of HIFR, um, we have a real focus on production of radioisotopes. And so we're one of the world's premier producers of radioisotopes for a whole variety of uses. And in addition, Oak Ridge will be the um, CGMP supplier of actinium 227, 225. I never remember which odd number it is, but it is the um, radionuclide that is in Bayer's new um, Zofigo product for treating um, recalcitrant prostate cancers. And so there's even now in the current era, there is a connection to um, drug discovery and, and treating human disease. So that's kind of exciting for someone who spent so long in the pharmaceutical industry. In addition to these user facilities, many of you will know the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, a user facility that provides um, high-end computing resources to the scientific community. Um, until last year, Summit was the fastest supercomputer in the world until they were edged out by a computer in Japan. But um, coming in the near future, uh, Frontier, we expect pieces to start getting shipped on site later this calendar year. And with the, uh, when Frontier finally comes online, Oak Ridge will celebrate because they will again be first on the fastest computer in the world. But in the computing realm with that cutting edge research side, they're also doing a lot of work around quantum computing and the algorithms that can map to that as well as the materials and the um, systems that allow you to do quantum computing and neuromorphic computing, trying to learn from biological processes, not just for algorithms like neural nets or deep learning, but analogizing from the way that um, biological systems in order to build the infrastructure that goes into making a computer. 
And so the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility is a huge component and one of the flagship user facilities at Oak Ridge National Labs. In addition, Oak Ridge is home to the Suppletion Neutron Source. And so thanks to the existence of HIFER and so forth, um, they have the world's most intense pulsed neutron source. And so they can um, look at structures, both biological and material structures and others at a really um, detailed level. And so one of my favorite stories that I often share but don't have a slide about is that a few years ago, they were able to take an E. coli cell grow it up in deuterated media in certain ways. So they deuterate the proteins and components of the E. coli. And then they added back undeuterated lipids and membrane proteins. And what that meant is because the deuteride deuterium is invisible to the neutrons, they were able to see structures of the lipid rafts in the E. coli membrane, structures of the membrane proteins in a living E. coli cell. And so imagine the possibilities with that kind of resource for the ways we could probe um, biology and human health in different ways with those kinds of resources. And so I came to Oak Ridge National Laboratory and what I do now, I came here to be the director of the Joint Institute of Biological Sciences it is a joint institute between Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the University of Tennessee system. So not just the flagship campus here in Knoxville, but also the UT Health Science Center that's headquartered in Memphis and has facilities in Nashville, Chattanooga, and Knoxville, and the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture and a whole host of anything, any of the toys that University of Tennessee has, I am able to play with as far as thinking about the joint JIBS and the Joint Institute for Biological Sciences. Um, the, my role here with JIBS has been, JIBS has been around for 20 years and um, the focus they've historically had is on biofuels and bioenergy and environmental remediation. How can you take switchgrass and poplars and extract as much energy out of it as possible? That mission has really become embedded in both Oak Ridge and the University of Tennessee. And so my task in coming here to Oak Ridge was to reimagine a new strategy at that interface between the two institutions um, for shifting the focus to biomedical research and health outcomes of relevance to this region and to the nation. And then um, starting April 1st of this year, um, I have a new title as well. Um, this one is in the computing directorate as the director of the computa of computational biomedical initiatives. And so really focusing on the relationships with NIH and the Veterans Administration and with the Atom Partnership that some of you have heard me talk about in the past and that Dashi, who's on the line with us today, is also involved with. Um, and then another big piece of work that you'll hear about through the rest of this talk. And so an exciting new role added to the JIBS role to really think um, expansively about how Oak Ridge might be involved in biomedical research in a lot of different ways. And so I mentioned the JIBS strategy. Yeah, I spent the first two years of my life meeting people, figuring out a strategy, um, Alan Graves is on the line. He'll have seen strategy temples before, and so he'll recognize the form and really building this strategy temple about what we would do and starting to do work together across all of these organizations to build this program and begin executing on things. And then, of course, the world changed for all of us. And so I have spent the last uh, year and a, a bit of my life really almost exclusively all COVID all the time within the context of the DOE uh, lab space. And so what I'm gonna spend the bulk of our time together talking about is this work that the Department of Energy has been doing in response to this crisis that we've all been facing. 
And uh, I know that many of us in this room will have been involved in this effort. Um, I don't want to give short shrift to any of that work. I'm going to focus today though on the specific pieces that we've been doing inside the Department of Energy. And so uh, the primary thing that we did inside of DOE is they formed this thing called the National Virtual Biotechnology Laboratory, which is invariably shorthanded to NVBL, which just reminds me of XKCD. They must have gone out of their way to pick a completely unpronounceable acronym. Um, but nonetheless, it, it describes what the what the project has been and what the organization has been. And so the, the research across all of NB, NVBL has been supported by the DOE Office of Science, a consortium of all 17 of those DOE national labs that you saw earlier in response to COVID-19 with funding provided by the Coronavirus Cares Act. And within the context of that work, there's a central coordinating committee at headquarters guiding this whole work. But in figuring out what we would do as a collection of laboratories, they sought input across all 17 labs from the grassroots up. And out of that crystallized five specific projects that have been going on within the lab complex. So the first of those is epidemiological modeling. And so capitalizing on some data sets that we have within the National, um, National Laboratory space that are not uh, widely um, available in other resources, combining those with the kinds of public data that you've seen out of Johns Hopkins and other resources, and uh, tapping into the geospatial um, modeling and capabilities across several of the national labs in order to build resources and do analyses and generate visualizations that um, allow for situational awareness for decision makers, not just within DOE, but across the government space. Uh, the second project that I'll mention is manufacturing. As many of you will have heard in the early days of the crisis, um, we were short on masks, we were short on ventilators. There was a real supply chain challenge and the manufacturing project was really working hard on how can we bring the resources of the national labs to bear to addressing these challenges as quickly as we possibly can and really focusing on transitioning those into specific partners in the industry space, not the national labs solving this problem, but helping enable many other companies to do so. So one small example that I'll just share in passing is that um, apparently when Coca-Cola makes two liter bottles for shipping Coca-Cola and Sprite and all, well, I guess they're seven up, whichever, all of those th sticky sugary things to us, they first start with very small presets that are small plastic tubes that eventually get blown up with hot air to form the bottle that the Coke will go into. Well, the National Lab Manufacturing Progress pro Program worked with Coca-Cola, determined that those uh, presets, preforms, are exactly the right size for transporting um, viral media for diagnostic tests. And so out of the billions of, and if not trillions of bottles that they produce at a time, enabling them and verifying that they are valid for use for this kind of purpose, um, they were able to split off a few millions of those and really make a difference in the um, pandemic without in any way impeding their delivery of sugary caffeinated beverages to all of us. Um, and so just a small snippet of the many projects that they worked on there. We're gonna hold off on molecular design because that's the project I'm associated with, but I'll mention that COVID-19 testing and R&D, how can we test better? What are the right primers? What are the right strategies? How can we do that at R&D to do our testing and diagnostics? better, faster, more reliably. Um, and the newest of the five projects is viral fate and transport. 
understanding what the virus does in a school bus with open windows going down the road, as opposed to a school bus in winter in Massachusetts where the windows are firmly closed and really trying to understand all of that. Um, in addition, actually before any of these five projects uh, started, they quickly spun off those computing resources that sit across the National Lab Complex and in partnership with places like Google and Microsoft and NVIDIA and Intel and IBM and all of the others, building a high performance computing simulation on demand resource that was used by many people across the research community, including probably some people that are in this room tonight. But as I say, today I'm gonna to focus on molecular design for therapeutics. And uh, this was a nine lab effort um, so I like to say that the project was nine labs across five states hitting all four time zones in the United States. And so I'm pretty practiced in doing the East Coast uh, plus five to get to um, UK time zones. This gave me a chance to remember who's in the central, who's in the Pacific and, and, and keep all of that straight. But more importantly, it was loads of fun to partner with this group of people across all nine of these national labs and really work together as a cohesive team, letting go this sense of ourselves as members of individual labs and really coming together as a full team working together. And the goal of our team was to leverage some of those user facility capabilities that I referred to earlier, the high performance computing, the light and neutron sources, and the chemical, biological, and analytical sciences that sit in so many of the other user facilities. And to bring those capabilities together in order to identify experimentally validated leads for targets across the entire coronavirus life cycle. And so I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's my firm belief that if you wanna go after a virus specifically, you have to target as many different parts of that life cycle as possible. As we've all learned from the research and the work that was done in HIV over the years, it is one way that you can hopefully tackle the virus itself. Um, and so we were trying to shut down as many parts of that process as possible. And we were aided by the fact that the light sources here in the national lab complex, but also worldwide, have produced a, a large number of structures that allow us to do this work and, and to discover molecules. Um, in order to do this work, we made use of computational and experimental design platforms that has been, been being built over the years, uh, funded by the Department of Energy, by R&D resources at each of the national labs by Department of Defense uh, sources, by a whole host of sources, really building capabilities that can be brought together into a platform that, as you would all guess, start with crystal structures and structural models, multiple antibody templates, databases of purchasable small molecules, feeds those data, into a whole host of computational experimental design platforms and couples that to experiment in order to produce input outputs that are designs that have a high probability of the desired activity, the desired biological effect and good physicochemical parameters. And I will say that one of the things I'm particularly excited about with this project is that DOE leads with computation and thinks first about computation, but they committed uh, to us enough that we had resources within our project to build biochemical assays, to um, solve crystal structures, and to, we had a nice big chunk of cash that was split primarily at Los Alamos and some here at Oak Ridge to actually physically make new molecules as part of this. And so we weren't having to do this in isolation as just computation. We had experiment coupled into the project as well. 
Um, a quick snapshot of the work on the design of therapeutic antibodies, largely led by the um, folks at Lawrence Livermore and at Sandia National Labs within the team. In this case, uh, the one example I'm showing you here, their design starting point was a neutralizing antibody against the original SARS-CoV that does not bind the spike from SARS-CoV-2. And using a Bayesian selection technology and targeting 31 specific locations on that starting structure, using physics-based and structure and sequence driven models, along with models of the quality attributes that you need for a therapeutic antibody, they were able to identify experimentally validated designed antibodies. So antibodies that were made by a partner, tested within our project, and have been shown to bind with very good affinity to the spike protein to disrupt the um, binding of that spike to the ACE2 receptor, and also showing in a cell-based assay that they can neutralize a pseudovirus system with the SARS spike in it um, from infecting cells. And so starting from original SARS, driving very quickly, and they got to this result probably within four or five months of us starting the project in April of last year. Um, we've also had a big focus on computational lead discovery. This is way too small text for any of you to read, but I will say that the stars on the right-hand side identify places where the National Laboratory light sources were involved in solving structures, either in providing their light sources to partners in industry and at academic institutions, or in solving structures ourselves in-house um, that were used then by this team and by the testing di and diagnostics R&D team. And the yellow stars on the left highlight some where we had some particular focus on the things that we were driving. And so all of you can imagine the kinds of things that the team would have done. Um, they used a variety of different docking algorithms, um, including some that people in this room were involved in developing in the past, um, but a variety of docking programs going ag against multiple binding pockets across a whole host of proteins of relevance to the virus and doing some some really quality work for selecting which molecules we would do something with. Um, <clears throat> and then, as I mentioned, we had built assays that allow us to explore, did these really work? Did we really get to what we wanted to do? And so within our team, having built four biochemical assays for four of the proteins we were target, targeting, and also through partnering resources at the University of Chicago and the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and their BSL-3 facilities, actually doing antiviral screens to ask whether we're killing virus. And so, let's see, do I actually give you, no, I don't, I'm gonna verbally then tell you some of the impacts that came out of this. And so out of the targeted work using biochemical assays, the team, since their institution, has identified a non-covalent inhibitor of the main protease. Um, the publication of, for that one just hit BioArchive recently, and it's out for review right now. Um, we have identified a covalent inhibitor of the main protease. I'll come back to that in a minute, and of the papain-like protease. And we've identified a family of related molecules of about on the order of 100 that have measured antiviral activity in our antiviral um, screen up here. We made a conscious decision to go into an antiviral screen first, even though having spent my time doing antibacterial research in my past, I know the pain and suffering of trying to figure out the mechanism of action, even for those compounds that you find that are active. But um, in the interest of speed in the face of this crisis, 
the computationally selected molecules went into this antiviral screen. And we do have this family of hits that have SAR embedded in them. And so uh, we are hoping to finish at least some of the mechanism of action studies for those molecules before we, we run out of cash and have to stop the project. And if and, and if and when that happens, uh, seeking out opportunities to continue the work to the forward. Um, I mentioned the proteases. Um, I will say uh, the SARS-CoV-2 proteases require a special workflow. Um, I don't know about y'all, but every time I would see a report of a clinical study taking HIV protease inhibitors into the clinic, thinking that those would work for COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 cysteine proteases, Many of you in the room know me, so you'll know steam came out of my ears and, and I had some harsh words to say about the whole thing. Um, aspartyl proteases are super different from cysteine proteases and cysteine proteases require a special workflow, especially relative to the kinds of tools that were available to the folks working on the project within the National Laboratory complex. And so <clears throat> the team here has built a workflow that allows you to take a database of compounds, identify all of the potential electrophiles that are in those molecules, transform them into a state that's suitable for forming the covalent interaction with the catalytic sulfur, and then uh, running a docking algorithm, sad to say it's autodock, but say la vie, um, and from that, feeding those results into a quantum mechanical reoptimization and frequency calculation in order to predict KI values. And so uh, that work was used in different pieces and aspects of our work with the main protease and the papain-like protease. And so where we're at on the covalent work is that <laughs> we do have a hit for the main protease that came completely and solely from this workflow and shows that, that they were able to build a workflow that did what they wanted it to do. Um, they selected and screened eight molecules and four of them are active. So uh, a decent hit rate. Um, we can talk about those things, uh, you know, hit rates and, and statistics and so forth later, but still the, the ability to build that pipeline and apply it and get a hit. We don't have the paper out on that one because we're still chasing some things like crystal structures and so forth, but um, look for that <laughs> to come out in the coming months. In addition, uh, with the papain like protease, I'm super excited with that result. It's more of a structure-based design that incorporated computational ways of scoring and thinking about it. And um, uh, Jerry Parks, Brian Sanders, and Stephanie Galaney, the team that designed that molecule, are working feverishly to get some new data to support a publication and some other work related to it. But what we can say now is that um, the lead compound from that series has 80 nanomolar potency at 30 minutes of incubation with the protein, um, shows time dependence in the biochemical assay, shows time dependence and cross-linking of the right molecular weight in a mass spec assay. <clears throat> and we're currently working very hard to get a crystal structure of that molecule bound to the protein. Um, have also enough sample that we're sending it off to look for selectivity against the human deubiquitinases and um, getting some of the microsomal stability data so that we can really, um, amongst all of, of the molecules that have come out of the team, this is the one to getting towards something that you could really start calling an advanced lead within the context of computer, of, of real drug discovery in a pharmaceutical company. Um, but for a bunch of folks who've never done drug discovery, who were starting from ground zero and to get to that phase, it's been amazing to work with them and to see how much progress that team of really amazingly smart people made. Um, in addition, as, as I mentioned earlier, we were working in a team across multiple time zones, multiple labs. We had 
about four different buckets of activity going on. And one of those buckets of activity was in building a dashboard from scratch that lets us track what's going on with all of those molecules. There's still work to be done here so that we're prepared for the next pandemic or the next time we need to work together in this kind of seamless cross lab way but um, exciting that they made as much progress as they did in bringing these results together in a dashboard that allows us to make decisions and to um, take action on the work that's going on. And so with that, I'm going to acknowledge the list of people that's on the molecular therapeutics team within the national lab space. Um, <clears throat> when I counted, I think I have a few names missing from this list. When I counted um, earlier this year, um, there were 157 people across all of these labs who were a part in, in small or large measure in this molecular therapeutics team. Um, an amazing group of people to work together and it's been loads and loads of fun. And some of the impacts of the molecular design team, uh, they really formed quickly and brought and applied their broad expertise to solving new structures, to building computational models, to using super computing resources to identify and design potential hits, developing assays and using them to really validate the computational um, predictions and obtaining experimentally validated antibody and small molecule hits. Um, and some of these activities came out all within the first six months of the project starting and work has continued since we started up in April. And I look forward to being able to share the full details of the story of this stories of this team with you as the months come along and, and the large number of papers get finished. Um, the team is continuing to refine those hits towards something that's more lead-like. And it's been really exciting to watch the DO e labs working together to do things that no single lab could have done alone. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see your faces again and read the chats that have come in. But it's been a delight to talk to you. And oh, Vicki, hi. Um, and uh, I can take any questions now. And so Rebecca, how are you going to facilitate questions? I will, if they come to the chat, they will be, I will um, unmute them and they can either ask their question or I will. Um, yeah, we'll try to mute you guys as soon as you can. First one I saw was Byron. Uh, you, you're free to ask your own question if you'd like, if you don't want me to read your question aloud. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, thanks, Marty. That was a fantastic talk. And it's wonderful to see, uh, you know, how the U.S. sprung into action against this. And, you know, thanks for everything you did. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I was following some of the other uh, initiatives. For instance, you must certainly know the COVID moonshot. Um, a lot of other nations uh, sprung into action and groups sprung into action as well. Um, uh, so I guess I have, I have another question that I'm going to ask, like, did you, how much coordination went on with them? Because I assume you would have been following along, you know, I thought the effort at the diamond light source to get fragments found and they were releasing that data in real time. I would hope that you'd be incorporating that into your efforts. Um, but a larger question is, you know, I'm wondering, you know, this is, you know, what struck me about all of these efforts and this coordination and this, this sort of totally open time is that people start working together and come up with potentially new tools that hopefully get shared into the community now that can be used for other things. So I'm wondering, do you see any open source tools that came out of these efforts that will be shared eventually? Um, so, so many layers to that question. First, I'll start with the other partnerships. Um, I would have loved to actually meld us with some of those other projects, but because of the way our funding is handled within the DOE space, I had to use our funds for DOE people. But that being said, well, gee, John Cadera was deeply attached to the COVID moonshot team. And Ed Griffin from AstraZeneca was a medicinal chemist closely partnered with it. And so we've had a number of conversations along through that process. And so for with that project in particular, um, some partnering opportunities in the main protease space have grown out of that work. And we'll be doing some work together um, 
our main protease non-covalent hit shares a lot of similarities with the class of hits that they've come up with out of that effort. And so really thinking about that work together. Um, I've gotten connected to someone at Northeastern University with that partnership who shares my love of covalent inhibitors. And we're working together on some potential follow-up on some covalent designs. So in that partnership thing, um, we were constrained in our operation of this project itself but are eager and excited and have been and hope to continue to be partnering with those groups because it is one of the really amazing things that we've seen happen during this time is really the world energizing and responding to things. And um, then you ask the question about tools. Eventually, all of the data we have generated, all of the computational, actually many of the computational results are out in, in the public domain at um, different individual lab locations. We hope to be able to put it into a cohesive whole to make all of that available for what it's worth. I mean, docking results. People on this call will know what I think about docking results. But um, uh, in addition, the experimental data will all move into the public domain. The structural data is already moving into the public domain. Yes, we're taking advantage of some of the fragment screens at Diamond and the stuff that Jamie Frazier has been doing out in San Francisco, some really gorgeous structures of ADRP that um, I pounced on as soon as I saw them and the team has been working with. Um, so those things will be going into the public domain. And yes, things are going into GitHub and will be going into the public domain and manuscripts will be being written. So it's a slower process than because of constraints. But, you know, I came from GSK. It seems pretty fast for getting data out there for, for someone who spent a long time in the pharma industry. So, um, yeah, I hope that answered the question, Byron. Okay, Rebecca, I who's next? So the next one that popped up in the chat was from Victoria. I can unmute her as well. Is the discovery of pan-COVID drugs a goal? If so, can you comment on the compound's activity across other SARS? Does the PL protease compound also inhibit SARS-1 or MERS PL protease? So um, a long-term aspiration is definitely pan-coronavirus, Vicki. Absolutely. And I'm, you know, some of the grant applications that we're going to put in are targeting pan coronavirus. Although, but in the context of this project specifically, we went after SARS-2. And so with the PL Pro inhibitors, with the, the panel that we're sending it to is gonna do human um, ubiqu deubiquitinases, and I believe the SARS-1 is in the mix. So that'll be really the first chance that we get a chance to look at that. Of course, the PL Pro question is complicated, because there's more variation in the number and the sequence conservation of PL pros across the corona, beta coronaviruses even. Um, and we are starting to do some work around chimeras and actual um, orthologs, homologs, whichever you want, I never remember the right word, uh, from the beta coronaviruses for the main protease because that's just a little bit easier to do. So yes, we care about that. We just didn't do anything about it during this first year. Okay, thank you. Great. And the, the next question I see, uh, Christian has his hand up, so I'm asking him to unmute. Go ahead. Hey, Martin, nice talk. Great to hear everything that's going on there. I think we've seen a lot of the problems have been around um, scale up and distribution with the, with the vaccine. I know there's little we can do about um, distribution, but scale up developability is always a major factor. Um, have you included any of that in there or any other type of you know, profiling or consensus modeling in there? Yeah, not in our project specifically. Um, and uh, in the wider community, really focusing on manufacturing of PPE and, and sort of tangible manufacturing things. Um, if there is money, that allows us to continue the work of NVBL for the future. The pitch I'm making to them is that even though I would not be the one to lead it because I don't know diddly squat about 
vaccines. Well, that's not quite true, but you know what I mean. Um, the pitch I've been making to them is that the resources of the user facilities and the light sources would be invaluable for thinking about some of these questions around the production of the vaccines and about rapid response at, to variants as well. And so my fingers are crossed, but I, I of course have, you know, we're eager to do some of that work within the national lab complex, but it was not a part of the body of work that we did in this first round of things. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I may not have been clear. I meant um, with your, um, project? Have you considered? Uh, no, you know, we really, yeah, we, given, yeah, so given the resources that we were at, and given the constraints of the charge we were given by DOE, we were focused on antivirals that target viral proteins or a small number of human targets that interact directly with the virus. So we okay. didn't do human immune response. We didn't do vaccines. Um, we did antibodies, nanobodies, and small molecule um, antagonists. And really focusing on hit finding, not developability of those. Uh, we tried to incorporate developability concepts as, as anyone who really cares about drugs would well, do. Exactly. I know you do. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, <clears throat> I, I, okay. Uh, we're recording, so I won't air some of the dirty women. <laughs> some of the day, someday over a drink, a glass of wine, I'll tell you why we weren't doing that, but we have found ways to do it as things progress to more advanced hit stage. Thank you. All right, I am going to selfishly butt in and ask my question. Okay. What was it like bringing all of your industry experience to work with all of these governmental labs that have never worked in industry? <laughs> I wish we weren't being recorded. Okay, <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'll say this, COVID changed everything. COVID changed everything. It's really different moving from industry to something is, that is much more academic-like. Um, and so my first two years with DOE, I felt completely lost. Like I was learn, having to learn from absolute scratch how to navigate processes, how, I mean, when I came on board and asked in the first instance, okay, so you've given me this task, what's the budget I have to work with? And they sort of laughed at me. Um, <laughs> that was my first introduction to how different it is in, in this world. And within the national lab complex, I think it's fair to describe them as sibling labs, siblings who love each other and siblings who battle each other sometimes. And um, really this um, interesting dynamic across the labs that's fun to watch. Um, but in light of this crisis, everyone moved fast and it really quickly became a true team. So I alluded to there were four different areas. Area one was computational and structural biology, understanding the targets we were going after. Area two was computational approaches to go after this stuff. Area three was the assays and the synthetic chemistry. And then area C, because I always have to have a touch of whimsy, was the cross-cutting area, building tools to integrate things together. Um, people know which area they're on more than they know which lab they're from. Gotcha. Publications are gonna come out across with multiple lab partners on all of them. There's not a single publication that I can think of that's sponsored by this work that does not include more than one national laboratory. And it went fast. This project, they first asked us to write the proposal on March 20th, and we were approved on April 20th. And the money ended up in everyone's bank accounts before the end of the week so that we could start our work. And so um, 
there is such amazing capability in the national labs. And with, when faced like a crisis like this, like so many that uh, Byron alluded to earlier, they really pivoted quickly, stepped up to the plate and took on a new way of operating. And the real hope is that that spirit of NVBL continues for other national crises, especially those that are more closely aligned with the traditional DOE mission space. That answer the question, Rebecca? That's great. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, aside from the cheeky ones from Brian Kelly and Ash, uh, <laughs> how, do you really feel, how do you really feel about docking? Um, Ernest Williams, are you able to separate the covalent and non-covalent contribution of the binding from your computational approach? Does the KI of the inhibitors you report include covalent binding contribution? And I'm asking him to unmute. So um, we are experimentally characterizing the binding and bond formation components of those covalent inhibitors. Um, the computational approach, the evil Q, allows you to get at some of that bond formation stuff. Um, and so ultimately, we do hope to be able to compute things that match those two things. But I have an amazingly skilled enzymologist and biochemist associated with the team who's actually measuring those things. Um, and so we actually know the answer about the, the binding component and then the bond formation components. All right, um, Ernest, do you have any follow-up questions or otherwise we'll move on to Sandor? All right, we're going to move on to Sandor. And I will get down to, to unmute him. Uh, how will this work continue? Will you need to apply for NIH grants? Yes. I can't hear you, Shondor. I think you're on mute. No, I'm on go. mute now. So that's my first question because then you are kind of more in an open community and you are in your world, whether you will have to write grants. Yes. And so, um, yes, there are several grants coming out of this work going to NIH and other resources. I'm not affiliated with all of them, thank the good Lord above. But mm -hmm. yes, so I will be. It's exposed to the community more. Yes. So you will get more feedback. Exactly. And so yeah. And we'll be exposed oh, so to the, even without those grant proposals, we'll be exposed to the community more. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and other than that, um, the non-covalent inhibitors, we're hoping to do some work inside the Atom Partnership to move those forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, if more funding becomes available through other resources, we'll just say it that way cryptically, um, we would continue the work that way. But really our goal right now is to make all of this, move all of this fully and completely into the public domain to get that feedback and to feed the next stuff. I mean, you know. beyond the public domain, I mean, the related question is that uh, you mentioned that uh, this is up to a degree very unusual at DOE, this type of work. So uh, will, you, will you have the DOE machinery to make, be, basically to transfer this to a pharma company some way? Because we know that in order to get a drug, you need a pharma company. Yeah. <clears throat> and so... We certainly will have access to the DOE machinery to translate some of these things to any pharmaceutical company that might have an interest in them. Um, and I can use the, the tech transfer teams to reach out and do that work. Um, um, and we have ways. So I look at these molecules and I know what more they need before a pharma industry partner would really be interested. And so it's that gap in the middle that I'm trying to solve now. How do I get the data that really supports a transition? And, and there may be some, there are some potential resources that I'm aiming for, but if anyone on this call has ideas for how I can find resources to fill that gap, especially since I came from a world where yeah, because that I gap doesn't that, exist. Yeah. You are, if not the most experienced, but one of the most experienced drug discoverers or pharma expertise within DOE, the entire DOE. I don't know. Uh, 
but that's my my feeling yeah there are a few others who come from pharma but yeah um we're we're thin on the ground inside of doe that is true so all right um brian kelly has a question about docking it's not really a question i i have i have a comment um so open i who i used to work at had a challenge many many years ago uh it was a docking challenge and one of the entries was marty where she would just sit down and say i think this pose should go here in this receptor and she handily beat every software package that we were using at the time um, but it does fall into a question that i had is that a lot of these structures, there's a lot of energy required to actually inhibit them, um, even more sometimes than if, even if you could make a covalent binder. And docking does nothing in terms of realizing that I can put something here, but it's not gonna do jack. So when you're looking at these structures, did you do that analysis first to see whether it was worth it or not? <laughs> so the one rule, so just to allude to the way it's written in the chat, the one rule that I gave the team is that we as a team were not allowed to try to find small molecules that bind to the spike protein and antagonize the interaction with the ACE2 receptor. Not allowed. I will not let you spend my money that way. And I know some of them thought I was a little bit of a hard ass for saying that. But seriously, a small molecule in spike? when you're talking about that stoichiometry and the kind of binding affinity that you're likely to get with a small molecule, OMG, no, we are not doing that. I would love to have been involved in a nitty gritty way in the selection of the pockets we go after for binding into, but the reality of the situation is that the scale is alluring and therefore they docked against a whole bunch of binding pockets on pretty much everything except the outside proteins on, on the virus. And, um, but then we got to choose from all of those, which of the molecules we're actually going to buy, which, which pockets did they target? And so, they ran a lot of stuff because they really do have a lot of computing resources, but we put thought and care into the several thousand molecules that we purchased to screen in the antiviral assay. And we put even more care and thought into the much smaller number of molecules that we bought that were targeting the enzymatic proteins in the, in the mix. And so if I had free reign, would I have been you know, more proscriptive in what we did? Well, Brian, you've known me for a long time. You know the answer to that question. <laughs> but uh, in many ways, I think it was probably good that they ignored me and didn't um, let themselves be limited by my perspectives on what they should do. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Ash. Uh, yeah. Brian's point is, yeah, that, that's hence hence the follow up question. You know, uh, what has been your experience like with machine learning? If you uh, if you if you were working with the right, uh, you know, training set or, or data set of covalent inhibitors, Marty. So we didn't. Uh, the machine learning aspects mostly were not directed towards the covalent inhibitors, um, and so, um, and even with. The places where it was so with the covalent inhibitors, I just no, I'm not I'm not going down that path right now because I don't think I could build a data set that would be appropriate for building a machine learning model that encapsulates that properly, especially given the dearth of data at the beginning of the crisis that would have been informative for this specific system. Um, yeah, machine learning models, they're only as good as the data you put into them and they need that constant feedback loop in the experiment to really work. So we focused on project on using machine learning in places where we could do that. And um, as you'll know, uh, when we're thinking about the non-covalent hit from the main protease, 
we, we do intend to use machine learning as part of that follow-up. But now we have more data and some ways to generate some more data. And it's still kind of small data for a, a good machine learning model, but it may be enough to give us toehold for that iterative approach. Do we have any more questions? Oh, Sandor's back. Let me get him. <laughs> Shandor and I have spent many hours over dinner with him asking, uh, each other asking questions of the other. So take it away. You should be able to unmute yourself. I can't unmute you myself, but you can hit the button now. It should be OK. It's an uncomfortable question. Uh, you know, DOE was great on computing science in the 70s, 50s, starting from the 50s, of course, going up to 70s, 80s. My feeling is that they lost this edge so, to some degree. I don't mm -hmm. know whether you agree with me or... or... Well, say, so, so we, we may have that conversation over a glass of wine someday, but say okay. more about what you mean by losing the edge. There's certainly... There were big names in DOE. DOE was the leading... Uh, you know, in sequence analysis, and, you know, the waterman Smith algorithm came out from Los Alamos, a lot of computational algorithm came out from, modeling came out, Lapidus, you know, ep epidemiology. There were a large number of really well-known names, you know, in, in DOE. I mean, uh, the genome project grew out from, obviously, from DOE, yeah. many of the computational aspects together. And then it's kind of, you still have big computers, but you may not have the big brains at this point. Well, it, uh, I think the difference, Shandor, is what they've been applying the big compute to. So yeah, DOE, no, DOE was very involved in the Human Genome Project, as you say. Yes. And some of the people who exist in that space are still here but they are a government lab. And they went through a phase where um, a previous administration, and I don't mean one or two back, but I mean several years back, a previous administration said, we need to have clean lines of accountability and different um, uh, departments of the US government have to focus on their area of control. Yeah. And so there's still a lot of really amazing computational brain power and horsepower dealing with the NNSA mission. I see, so it's dealing, not that easy. Dealing with um, bioenergy and biofuels, mm -hmm. dealing with materials science. Um, and so there's still, a, I have met some of those really amazingly smart people. They're just not operating in the world that you and I know. I see. And so the question mm -hmm. is how, because there is a special mm -hmm. expertise that comes in applying computational methods in our world. Mm -hmm. You can't just pull a tool off the box and throw it at a protein inhibitor system and expect, uh, yeah. Doc can tell you about some molecules that made me write, raise my eyebrows recently from a computation. Um, there is this whole, um, but there's these amazingly smart people where if we're given the room and the runway to get back into biomedical research and human health research again, I think you'll start to see those amazing names grow up. They won't be the same names you know from the past. Mm -hmm. that's, just, you know, that's my hope. That's my hope. I'm working and, at a, a place, you know, Boston University frequently called the, uh, the second Los Alamos, Los Alamos refugees. We have a lot of people who actually <laughs> came from, you know, yeah, Los yeah. Alamos from this uh, time of, of when Los Alamos was the leading. Yes. Of, yes. As a matter of fact, when I first came to Oak Ridge, I was working with Paul Gilna, who was at Los Alamos in that time working on the mm -hmm. Human Genome Project. Um, he has since retired and, and so forth. So I don't have my partner in crime anymore. But um, yes, that same capability still exists. Mm -hmm. The question is having the ability to apply that capability. Well, of course, and if they focus, they will have the resources probably. Exactly, exactly. And so it's a, it's a fraught political question that I will not go into any more detail over but it's another of those over a glass of wine conversations. Mm -hmm. we Unfortunately, no. 
All right. So I think we're about 10 minutes past time, creeping up on 15 minutes past time. Um, I'm going to halt questions here and say thank you so much, Marty. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk. It was a great look inside what's going on at the National Labs and all of your adventures in COVID land. So can, let's all give Marty a great big round of applause, either virtually or like I'm just going to clap at the screen. So <laughs> thank you so much. And it's great to see so many familiar faces. Have a great night, everybody. And I hope to meet some of the people that I don't know in person in one day in Jerusalem. So.